Very good afternoon from my part. I'm delighted to be here sitting on this very nice uh, sunny afternoon in Paris in the basement surrounded by one of the very efficient teams that the EAR has. And as you heard, I will speak about a topic that is the continuation of a book that I wrote. It was published in 2021 in AI We Trust, Power, Illusion and Control of uh, Artificial Intelligence. And the reason for turning towards the theme of illusion of control has to do with the developments that we have seen since. Most spectacular of all was in uh, recently in 2022, end of 22, the um, unleashing of an experiment, I would say, without anyone's consent, namely ChatGPT was uh, taking the world in storm. And it had the advantage, um, without asking our consent, it had nevertheless had the advantage that many people were brought into direct content with a digital technology that otherwise would be further away from their daily concerns. And what we have seen since is um, a dazzling performance of um, the <clears throat> what AI could do. ChatGPT, as you know, <clears throat> belongs to something uh, belongs to what we call generative AI based on large uh, language. You know, as you can see, to be in control of technology is never an easy task. But here we are. And the performance of this generative AI has um, indeed surprised even experts. They knew it was coming. For experts, this was no surprise. They knew it was coming. But um, nevertheless, uh, the performance was quite uh, amazing. So in control, uh, at least of this slide we are. And uh, as always, uh, when a new technology hits the market or is um, advertised, there are lots of promises that, that come with it. There is inevitably hype surrounding it. And of course, there is also in these cases uh, quite a bit of um, investment pouring into it. So we can, of course, discuss whether this uh, will be just another hype or whether it's here to stay. But I would say there are many reasons why I think uh, this is not just the usual hype, although most likely uh, there will be a peak and then there will be less uh, enthusiasm. And the reason is, uh, is, is twofold. One, because there are huge investments that are being put into it. It's a kind of bet on too big to fail. But the other reason is <clears throat> just as important, namely that uh, it makes already quite a difference in science. Working scientists are adopting it. <clears throat> you may have heard of AlphaFold. A, <clears throat> this was launched by, by uh, DeepMind. And uh, it really is a fantastic tool that life scientists are now using. And other <clears throat> such tools are going to follow in areas of material science, drug discovery, et cetera, et cetera. So there is an enormous potential. And again, uh, during the discussion, we can go into the various fields, what it will do, not just in the medical field, but especially in the educational field. But most of us he, uh, still are in a kind of uneasiness. And the uneasiness, we all know about it. Um, this time, it's partly based on automation. We know that automation will do away with jobs. It will create new jobs, but nobody knows how fast new jobs will be created. What is less talked about, but in my view, much more important is whether we will come up with new tasks that will be um, <clears throat> carried out together with AI. And I think this is the crucial uh, component. If we can invent new tasks 
then I think um, the uneasiness about the job market and just um, jobs disappearing will be somewhat um, diminished. Then there are the concerns about deep fake, what it does to um, liberal democracies. If we have um, very deliberate forms of disinformation that is widely circulating, nobody seems to be in control of anything except those who launch these uh, deliberate disinformation. We know about the old problems of biases that are already in data that are then carried on to the operations of the algorithms. And once people start to believe what the algorithm predicts, we have the bias deeply entrenched in society. There's the question of trust. There is uh, the, the related question, will we end up with so-called personalized realities? Each of us has his or her own personalized reality, which means we are losing common ground. But, and this is um, the main theme I want to uh, follow here, there is the, a deep-seated fear of losing control. This goes back in, in history because humans were always surrounded by first nature, but then also the machines that people were felt exposed to, not quite knowing, would it change them? Would it change their work, their relationship, um, et cetera? And especially in uh, Western societies, this is very much linked to, to the high value we give to the individual. And so the individual is touched by this fear of losing control. Last but not least, um, we are also confronted with anthropomorphic tendencies, namely, we tend to um, allocate or uh, attribute intentions to things, or even if we know they are things. When your computer does not work, you get upset and you say, you stupid thing, just as you did to your little brother when he did something that uh, you know upset you. And we know, of course, um, the computer is a thing, but this is one uh, example um, of an anthropomorphic tendency. The philosopher Daniel Dennett has written um, extensively on this. He called it the intentional stance. And um, we can see it in, in, in practice when people say, the AI knows me better than I do myself. And this is uh, for me always uh, somewhat shocking when I hear someone say this because it means um, the anthropomorphic tendency is at work and some kind of uh, almost metaphysical power is transferred to the machine that now knows me better than I do myself. And even if people know the machine does not understand, it does not know it is a machine, nevertheless, this is very pervasive. And we had one uh, tragic case uh, last year in Belgium. This was um, a person with mental problems who was using one of the many therapeutic apps that are in the US completely unregulated and talking with this therapeutic um, app the, um, the the user was discussing suicidal tendencies and the, uh, the AI in the end said, yes, that's the best solution if you kill yourself. So this is a tragic extreme, but it shows how far uh, this can go if we don't take precautions. Now, <clears throat> what is the illusion of control and how is it related to technology? Now, when it comes to technology, control is essential because otherwise a technology would not work. So every engineer knows um, errors might happen, maintenance is important, repairs have to be carried out in order to keep the uh, technology working, and this means keeping it under control. But if we look back just a little bit in history, we can see that we have expanded the notion of control of technology. And it started during the um, uh, during industrialization, when people realized it's not enough to have a machine working, but you also have to make sure that the 
workers, the people who operate it, are not killed or injured while uh, working with the machine. So the control had to be expanded to guarantee the safety and health of the workers. Then eventually we had a welfare state, and now we have, at least in the, in the Western countries, highly industrialized countries, we have quite a bit of um, legislation, obligatory insurance, et cetera, precautions, extending the impact a technology has on the, the effects. And this is health, this is safety, and um, since the last uh, 20, 25 years, it expands also to the environment. We want to make sure that the technology does not um, continue to damage uh, the, the environment. And now comes the big next challenge in extending this control with AI, because how can we make sure uh, that we can still control the impact it has on our cognitive and emotional capacities. And this is clearly seen in play when we think of the um, of, of predictive algorithms, which are very important, where with a predictive algorithm, we tend to forget that all the AI can do is to extrapolate from data from the past. The AI does not know the future because nobody knows the future. The future remains uncertain. But um, by extrapolating from the past, for we are creatures of habits, so certain things we do just the same as we did yesterday or one year ago. So these predictive algorithms are already surrounding us whenever you open an app, when you're looking for a restaurant or what to buy, etc. predictive algorithms are at, at work. And we tend to attribute agency to the machine. Now, this is <clears throat> uh, very innocuous if you want to know about restaurants, but at the other extreme, this is something we are confronted with now, autonomous weapons. We see they are already in use in the wars we have right now. And this would mean that um, human agency is delegated to a weapon system that is impossible to, to recall. And behind all this, we have this enormous concentration of economic power. We have the large international corporations and um, the states, governments struggle in regulation. Now, there is um, a kind of um, continuum of, of regulation, the EU, uh, with a package of legislation, the last of which is the AI Act, is at the forefront internationally, but then there is the USA, where uh, which in general is rather reluctant about regulating because people fear it would stifle um, innovation, and also big tech has quite a bit of lobbying power also, and then we have China. So in this geopolitical configuration, uh, Europe, despite being at the forefront, um, you know, is, 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 can only regulate it so much. I come to my uh, last, be last before last uh, slide, where I would just raise a question. And the question starts with reminding us of a figure of the Enlightenment, Gian Battista Vico, who um, is still remembered today because of this one sentence that you see here, Vico said, we understand only what we make. And this is something that every practitioner, every scientist can immediately relate to because, uh, you know, once you take things apart you, or you build new ones, you understand how you make them. And my question is, um, are we not moving towards a human-made world where we no longer understand what we mean. We are speaking about the Anthropocene, and even if it has not been officially approved by the geologists who are the gatekeepers of the age of the Earth, whether it's indeed a new epoch or not, but it is clear we live in a human-made world that has an enormous impact on climate change, on uh, the extreme weather phenomena that, that we have seen, but also 
AI enables us to build what are called digital twins. So you can have a model representing a phenomenon or an artifact or you know a landscape or uh, indeed in principle you can have a kind of mirror world which is a digital mirror world and <clears throat> therefore the question is if we live in this world that we no longer understand what what we make what uh, <clears throat> what are the consequences uh, we have also the, realized that uh, there's an acceleration going on of technological change. Complex systems have features linked to the emergence due to the interconnections of component parts of a system that produces new phenomena that are very difficult, if not impossible, to predict. And we also have new fascinating research questions. And just to give you a, a bit of a flavor, let me just uh, <clears throat> tell you one little uh, episode. I was discussing with a friend of mine, a mathematician, when um, when he was losing using a generative AI model, and he said, "Well, I gave the AI a problem, um, algebraic problem that um, is sort of medium difficulty, and it solved it without problem. It made some mistakes." but also <clears throat> good mathematicians might make similar mistakes. But what surprised him was the way how to reach the solution. The machine was working in a different way than a mathematician would have done. And this raises the question, you know, is it our brain that works differently from the machine or is it mathematics? Because mathematics is a human invention it's a cultural technology, if you want to call it that way. And how does it influence? So this is one of the research questions. We can speak about language, we can speak about identity and, and others. And <clears throat> finally, uh, I was fascinated, and this is a speculative thought on, on, on my part, and I want to you to take it as a kind of speculation, because I think there must still be room for speculation and expanding our imagination. This is a book by Marshall Salins, a very eminent um, anthropologist who died last year. And this is sort of his life's work. And he shows, um, he has collected an enormous amount of empirical material from all living and, and past cultures of the world. And he calls it most of humanity. And he shows that most of humanity lived in what he calls an imminent cosmos. This was a world in which humans shared their world with spirits, with gods, with God, with ghosts, with all kinds of entities. And he has these many empirical examples, if you were a canoe maker, it was not enough that you were a skilled draft person. You had to somehow to get the spirit of canoe making on your side. Or if you were a woman tending your garden, you had to speak to the spirit that looked after particular plants in your garden and had to get them as, as alliances. And I, I was just struck by this um, you know, comparison. And I'm just wondering, we will have to learn how to live with digital others, as I call them. And um, <clears throat> this is an open co-evolutionary trajectory on which we have engaged humans and the machines created by humans. But how we will learn to live with them is an open question. To come back and to close um, about illusions, this is what Richard Feynman, a very famous physicist, had to say. Science is what we have learned about how to keep from fooling ourselves. So illusion, as I said, is a tricky concept because those who are in an illusion are not realizing they are in an illusion. It's only when there's a harsh confrontation with reality that they wake up and they are realizing uh, the world is different from what I thought. And science gives us uh, <clears throat> the encouragement that we have to 
remain skeptical. Skepticism is a scientific virtue. And this is something that we also have to tell society because um, scientists are learning how to keep from fooling themselves. But I think it is also something that is badly needed to tell to society and to politicians. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Helga, for the presentation. Um, all right, we we are happy to take questions. Yes, so we have one. Uh, what do you think will be the impact of AI on the way we do social science? Well, <laughs> I think for social science, it presents um, an, a, a very new and really big opportunity in the sense that um, it allows us to, um, in, in the ideal case, to establish new links between what we call qualitative research and quantitative research. Because qualitative research by definition goes in depth. It's what uh, Clifford Gertz called, you know, <clears throat> the, the deep knowledge, um, the thick knowledge. Um, and that is limited in terms of um, data that we can collect. It's limited uh, because it happens in specific contexts, etc., and we cannot upscale it. But AI, in principle, could allow us to extract sufficient qualitative uh, data of high quality, and with the help of AI, to analyze them and, and further uh, process them. So I, I think this is a new opportunity that AI offers. Beyond that, uh, you know, it remains to be explored. I think with every innovation, you have certain uses that seem obvious, but if you look back historically, you very often discover that people invent new uses, that no one thought of when the technology arose. Famous example is the, the transistor. Um, and then people started to discover, I can have a portable radio and take it with me to when I go to the park or when I meet my friends. And uh, this had a huge impact also on you know social life and, and, and connections. So I think we will see some new inventions in terms of use uh, of AI also in the social sciences that we don't foresee right now. Thank you. Uh, I believe the sound might have returned your mics, ideally. Um, Let's try. Let's try. There's yeah. nothing like trying out. Any other questions? No sound yet. Okay. And no written, uh, no written question. Not yet. Um, yes. So Daniel says, thanks for a very interesting talk. It strikes me there are two ways a system can be out of control. Systems can be random and stochastic chaos, or they can be controlled according to the goals and wishes of something else. Do you think AI has goals like these? Well, I would rephrase it and I would say, you know, what are the goals uh, of the people who develop, program, own, invest in AI? Because an AI has only goals that have been inscribed into it and that it has been um, instructed to carry out. And here we come to what I alluded to when I spoke about the enormous concentration of power, of economic power which of course is also in you know. And um, I was particularly interested also in what happens with uh, the funding of AI, because that's one of the indicators. And uh, very important also for regulation of AI, it needs to be implemented. And who is going to implement whether a regulation is being fulfilled and carried out in accordance with the wishes of uh, the legislator. And here I discovered 
that if you compare funding of research and development, the two categories are always taken together. This research is mainly carried out at universities and development happens um, <clears throat> to a large part in, in industry. And in OECD countries, about roughly two thirds of funding for R&D come from the private side and one third comes from the public side. But if you look at AI funding, the relationship is 90% uh, coming from private and only 10% from public. And this means universities are disadvantaged. They don't have access uh, to the kind of computing power that is needed. Uh, they don't have access to the data because uh, the large companies do not have to um, you know, be open about the data that they use, nor the algorithms. They can own algorithms, uh, and uh, there's no obligation to um, go public with the algorithms they use. So this becomes very difficult. And of course, it also sets the direction of research. Now, every company assures you everything they do is for the best of humanity. But if we take a closer look, we see very clearly um, these are companies and therefore they want to make profit, which is a legitimate goal for, for a company. But they are driving the further development of AI in two directions that they want to see. And uh, I think that um, indeed we would need much more awareness the public funding in AI research, especially also in fundamental research, is needed, for instance, to discover which were the roles that were not taken and uh, not just to blindly follow the kind of directions that are now being pursued. Thank you very much. Um, we have another, do you think, Auton autonomous weapons will become the new army standard? Well, I'm not um, an expert in autonomous weapons and uh, you know I've only followed what what is known in the in the public domain. but it's very clear that uh, this is the direction in which the development goes. And given the rapid development in AI, what we are seeing now uh, is partly, you know, the testing of uh, weapons that have been in the making. And I'm afraid we are moving rather rapidly in this direction. And whether it will be possible to reach an international agreement as we reached with nuclear weapons, to have an um, international agreement against proliferation of nuclear weapons, whether we will be able to reach something for AI-driven, AI-based autonomous weapons is an open question. And I see many obstacles um, because with nuclear substances, you can trace them, uh, but with AI, this is much more complex. Wonderful. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, we have other questions. One of the advantages of AI is instantaneous translation. Yes, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, there are many advantages. You know, I'm not um, here to tell you there are only uh, problems with it. Uh, and one is indeed the way how, um, uh, you know, language recognition has progressed uh, enormously. And this means translation is becoming very, very easy. Uh, I think um, you can see already many universities are closing their departments for translation studies because um, students don't believe that they have a future in there. It will also mean many people think we don't have to study another language because we will have the machine uh, that tells us uh, and, and, and we can get by. So there are, is always some losses connected with it. But it will facilitate um, uh, automatic translation tremendously. Also, the writing of books. There are uh, 
books that are already written by, by AI. We can discuss the quality and people say, well, certainly the quality will improve, but most likely we may end up with a segregated market. So you have a sort of mass production of books by AI, and then you have a sort of, you know, elite uh, luxury market where it's still humans that write good books and a readership that appreciates uh, what humans do. Wonderful. Thank you. And I think we will have um, the last one, which is uh, Lila Barber says, considering human ways of making sense, like applying anthropomorphism to AI and the potential dangers of misunderstandings like these, how can we communicate the new digital technology socially? especially when already we are seeing conversations about AI that almost seem religious. Yeah, no, there is a huge um, um, challenge before us how we can increase awareness. Uh, I don't like the term digital literacy uh, very much because it's much more than the ability to, you know, to code or to, to be familiar with AI but really to, uh, awareness, uh, first of all, it is a technology that is made by humans, owned by humans, directed by humans, and to stay clear of a sort of technological determinism, because that's the flip side. I was speaking about the illusion of control, but there's also the illusion of not being in control. And when people start to feel they are powerless, there's some kind of, uh, you know, um, ubiquitous force that is much stronger and then they give up. They are afraid, they retreat in fear, the worst thing that can happen. You retreat in fear, you become passive. And so I think it is important to increase awareness, starting with, uh, with children, but every age, every adult, to make them aware of what are the potentials, but also um, where do we have to be rather careful in how we deploy it? Thank you so much. Um, so uh, that's all the time we <laughs> have for the first talk. So thank you so much, Helga, for joining us.